so it's 11 35 and again a very very warm welcome to all of you who are in and for those who are joining in they can join in uh, a warm welcome to the conclave season three of canadian universities and colleges along with the virtual education fair this is going to be happening over three days today is the first day and this is the first session of day one so a quick introduction to who is CanAm. We at CanAm have been pioneers in career counseling for students headed to Canada for the past 27 years. CanAm has been very special to Canada and a leader in promoting Canadian education. We have a large network of offices in 30 plus locations across India and are members of major recruiting bodies throughout the international education sector worldwide. Our career counselors are highly experienced with decades of experience in recruitment processes, programs, admissions, and compliance. At CanAm, we value a strong working relationship with our university partners, which is a huge benefit to our students. Anurad Sandhu, CEO of CanAm, is an ICCRC, or sorry, a regulated Canadian immigration consultant, RCIC, and thus licensed by the Government of Canada to provide guidance on study permits and immigration advice. We connect with over two and a half lakh students and professionals each year to apply to university and college admissions around the world. And our free services include live interaction with delegates through webinars, visits, conclaves, uh, live sessions, in-person and virtual career counseling, admission services, visa guidance, getting application fee waivers wherever possible, providing scholarship options where possible, and interview preparation where it's needed. 97.2% of tens of thousands of students applying through CanAm get accepted into their choice of programs in Canadian institutions each intake. And we would like you to be one of our success stories as well. So how do we get it right at CanAm? High quality personalized counseling by highly experienced counselors. They've been with us for very, very many years. They've been trained by universities. Facilitating direct communication with universities and colleges through various events that we do, our in-office visits, through webinars, conclaves, artificial intelligence-driven smart search technology for custom match of profile, eligibility, and field of interest developed over inputs from 10 million man hours of counseling over 27 years and perfected ISO accredited application processing systems for over 27 years. So on to the panel today, based on uh, Canadian education and skill development planning for Indian students and working professionals. The topic for today's session, this session is choosing programs to upgrade skills and employability options in Canada and post-graduation work permit updates. So our panelists for today are in alphabetical order, Hazel Ceremony. International Recruitment Specialist, Manitoba Institute of Trades and Technology. Hazel has three decades of experience in the education sector, of which she has engaged for over two decades in the Canadian education space. In 2014, she received the Governor General of Canada's Gold Medallion in recognition of her work in promoting Canadian education in India and building strong ties between Canada and India in the area of education. Happy to have you here, Hazel. Our next panelist, Jeevan Dhaliwal, Director of Co-op and Career Services at ILAC Education Group, Ontario and Alberta. Jeevan builds and manages the Co-op and Career Services Department at ILAC Education Group. He is the Acting Director of Co-op and Career Services. He has worked in Hanson, Canada for more than two years, where he helped international students with their plans for career goals, and he also navigated the Canadian workforce to gain meaningful experience. He has completed his bachelor's from Birmingham City University in the UK. Welcome to the session today, Jeevan. Luke LaRoche, Vice President Operations Support and Global Sales at LaSalle College and LCI Education Network. Now, Luke is 20 years in international business, specialized in global operations and mentorship. When the education sector became a passion, he took the position of VP Operations Support and Global Enrollments of LCI Network, including Canada, Europe, and Australia. Having the New Delhi office reporting to him directly, he is very hands-on in building multiple relations between Canada and India in the area of education for the LCI network. Happy to have you with us, Luke. Our next panelist, Saurabh Malhotra, Director, International Recruitment and Market Development at Fanshawe College. 
Saurabh is the Director of International Recruitment and Market Development at Fanshawe College. He's worked in the international recruitment area for 12 years. Saurabh is responsible for managing and leading the international recruitment, digital, and communications team at Fanshawe. The team has more than 25 people, including digital and communication. Members based in London, Ontario, and international representatives based in South Korea, China, Turkey, Colombia, Brazil, Philippines, Vietnam, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Russia, almost all over the world. Thank you for being with us today here, Saurav. Your team is responsible for recruiting and engaging more than 8,000 international students at Fanshawe from 100 plus countries. Wow. Our next panelist is Tatiana Christofi, Lead Community Manager, Global University Systems. Tatiana is Lead Community Manager at Global University Systems. She is based in sunny Cyprus. She's been in the international education industry for over 15 years. She's also a B2B sales, marketing, and business development specialist. She's held hundreds of business meetings in 19 countries and helped thousands of international partners and students explore study opportunities abroad. Wow, well, happy to have you with us today, Tatiana. And our final participant today is Yut Gerber Shagan, a graduate recruitment coordinator at Goodman School of Business, Brock University at St. Catharines, Ontario. Youth has worked in higher education for the last 13 years across a variety of areas within admissions, marketing, and student recruitment. She spent several years working at King's College London in the UK before joining Brock University as graduate recruitment coordinator for the Goodman School of Business at the beginning of 2022, where she manages the school's outreach and recruitment activities and acts as the first point of contact for any student interested in joining Goodman's graduate business programs. Thank you, Yud, for being with us today. And with that, our panel discussion starts now. Don't forget to type in your question and WhatsApp number in the city you are located in to chat admin in the chat box. And if your question is absolutely unique in general, we'll pick it up for one of our panelists to answer. If your query is specific to your case or profile, an expert Ganam counselor closest to your location will contact you in the next two working days. Thank you for joining in the session and over to the panel. So, uh, choosing programs to upgrade skills and employability options in Canada and post-graduation work permit updates. Now, top concerns of international students post-2019 has been about choosing the programs of study which have higher employability and better affordability. Now, employment opportunities both during study and post-study and friendly immigration policies are now a major factor in student decision-making on their study destination. Now, but what we also see this year is that students are looking closely at program costs, mainly because of the economic toll that the pandemic has taken on families around the world and the fall in the Indian rupee. Not just lower tuition fees or scholarships, but in the larger context, on the return of investment that they can anticipate through post-graduation employment and settlement opportunities, career supports, and graduate outcomes. So Canadian education ranks number one on all these factors with work terms, semesters of soft skill training, strong industry partnerships, high employability rates with job readiness and promises by colleges to create equity of career support with domestic students. After you graduate from your program of studies, you may be able to work temporarily, after which you could even live permanently in Canada. This is what makes Canada most exciting. Students are smart. They want to be ready for the Canadian job market. Our today's esteemed panel will answer questions related to these points. My first question goes to Hazel. Hazel, you've counseled thousands of Indian students in the decades of experience you've had while promoting Canadian education. How do Canadian institutions address the employability needs of the industry and match the students to the jobs? Give us about some special success stories of students during their co-ops and into their post-graduation work permit period. Thank you, Ganga. Absolutely a pleasure to be here and uh, to see so many of my co-panelists here, familiar faces, lovely to see all of them. To address your question, absolutely. I mean, having seen over, this would be my third decade, uh, especially with Canadian education space. So seeing the whole canvas of it, uh, can, our institutions have really responded uh, and they're very highly sensitive to the demand. And that has been something, and especially in a college environment, 
a college like MITT especially, we have been focusing in kind of readying our student and responding to not just the student need, but we are also looking at the uh, needs of our industry as well and respond and match that. So we are right in the middle of that relationship. So our programs are also crafted. And I can say that I'm sure my colleagues here will, um, you know, uh, in their institution context as well. But institutions are crafting their programs, which means the curriculum, the syllabus is constantly being up to date and being responsive. Um, at MITT, one of the things we did was we conducted a survey just to actually measure this. And 96% of our students are working in their related field. The other thing what we did as an initiative in response, and especially during the pandemic time, at, as the demand started increasing in assessing the investment on their uh, returns on their investment, we introduced something called Work Skills Foundation. And that was right from day one, students were expected uh, to be prepared uh, and to be job ready the moment they come out so that they are able to pick a job related to the field equipped with skills uh, that is so necessary. I'm gonna stop here, but happy to continue with this conversation further. Thank you, Ganga. Thank you, Hazel. My next question goes to Jeevan. Uh, Jeevan, with your exposure to the labor market, you provide a unique and valuable service to international students. Would you like to tell us about one, the evolving Canadian job market in Alberta and Ontario as you offer career services in both these provinces? Yes. Two, yes. on how to choose a program to skill oneself to be a successful entrepreneur in Canada? And three, how can students prepare themselves for such a role while studying in Canada? Okay, so thank you, Ganga. And thank you everybody for having me here today. Um, so Canada's very, very unique in that it openly talks about how important international students and immigrants are to the labor market. So in the last five years, between 2016 to 2021, there was 1.3 million immigrants welcomed into Canada, and they were essential for Canada to be able to support itself, especially with a retiring population and as people moved into jobs higher and higher. Now, during the pandemic, we've seen some changes. For example, um, there was a huge increase in the number of healthcare workers who were required, whether that's in nursing, whether that's as personal support workers, or whether that's in administration. And even last year, the government in Ontario announced that they would be bringing in 20,000 positions over the next few years. So we're gonna be seeing a lot more investment in healthcare, the technology sector is still in its infancy in Ontario and in Canada, and we're seeing a lot more development and we're seeing even potential unicorn um, organizations developing in Canada. So even when it's whether it's an established organization or a startup, the tech sector is got so much potential in Canada. We've also seen that there's been a rebound in the services industry. So whether that's in restaurants, whether that's in hospitality, they have recovered to a almost close to the pandemic number and they will still continue to grow. We are also seeing that I think in 2018, a, an agreement between the Canadian and Indian government saw a $250 million investment from companies such as Tata Consulting and Infosys. Um, so even Indian companies are seeing just how important it is to invest in Canada because there's so much potential here that if you come and study that there are jobs available, um, that every industry that I've mentioned so far are ones that are looking to grow. Um, so if I look at, for example, business and administration, in the three years between 2019 and 2022, there was an 80% increase in the number of vacancies. In the service industries, um, there was an 87% increase in the number of vacancies. So there are a lot of vacancies for trained and skilled professionals from around the world. And this is where Canada is very unique in how welcoming it is to immigrants and international students. Um, and then what was the next question, Linda? Okay. Uh how can students prepare themselves for such a role while studying in Canada? Okay, so when students are um, 
actually studying, if they are looking to open up their own business, if they're looking to go into more roles where they eventually want to become CEOs, managers, and founders, the very first thing I would prior I would say to prioritize are your studies. Um, again, as you are international students, your studies are very important because employers look at your transcripts. If you are planning to have your own business one day, or you're wanting to go into a senior position, finding a college that offers what's called work integrated learning. So that might be an internship. It might be a business research project where you can actually learn the ins and outs of a business. Um, so for example, um, I work closely with Saurabh um, from Vanshaw College, and we have students who are taking part in our hospitality programs. And a lot of them have talked about wanting to open up a hotel. So one of the experiences they are going to gain is through an internship. They'll actually get to go out into a real life hotel and they'll learn all the different departments of how that hotel operates. So that ultimately in the future, when they want to open a hotel or a motel or something similar, they've had some kind of experience. The other things we would recommend is looking to work with your career services. So last year, for example, we. Uh, brought in at one of our ILAC PPPs. We brought in a immigrant who sold his business for $160 million. And he came in and gave unique advice to our students on the challenges as an immigrant, what he knew, um, what he wished he knew before he opened the business. Um, so making sure you're really being involved is important. And also the very, very big thing in Canada, approximately 60% of jobs are filled through referrals. So if your goal is, I want to get into a business, um, you, you have to make sure you're networking, you're, whether that's in person, whether that's in LinkedIn. And this is where student services and career services can also provide support. For students who actually want to look at opening a business, I would also encourage you to make sure that you're monitoring your finance, your credit rating. Because if you're looking to gain investment in the future, it's going to be very important that you can show you know how to manage your finances. And then I will stop there, but I could go on. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jeevan. Uh, my next question is to Luke. Luke, uh, most students want to explore the post-graduation work permit that they qualify for after studying in Canada. Now, how does LaSalle College in Montreal empower and prepare students who are looking to obtain necessary skills to enter the Canadian job market or look or are looking for a second career. Now give us examples of successful alumni at La Salle. Also give a brief on benefits of studying in Quebec and is French necessary to get jobs in Quebec. And also one hears that hospitality, art and design, IT programs are in huge demand. So is that all true? Good, good morning, good evening to everybody. I think it's evening, uh, morning over with you. Sorry, I got all handsome for you guys, but uh, my camera doesn't seem to want to open. I will keep trying after this uh, this talk. I think in Canada right now, and especially in Montreal, we have a lot of issues. I think it's important to discuss when they are being discussed uh, and, and mentioned, but we are able to study in English. We are the largest Canadian school that is bilingual. We have uh, a lot of uh, production like that. And when we are moving with with uh, studying in Quebec, we have a lot of companies. Most companies are affiliated with us because we work for 65 years in Montreal. Therefore, all students have their work session or internship with uh, uh, tech companies, especially uh, all the IT and the, the uh, hospitality. In Montreal, we have a huge lack of uh, staff, as everybody knows. And uh, it is important to understand that many of those programs, IT and cybersecurity and hospitality and all of those are absolutely uh, in demand. And uh, Montreal, we always, it's very difficult to have find one company that is complete in staff. So job wise, it is definitely a plus. How to study with the work permit in Montreal. We all understand that <clears throat> La Salle is not, uh, is a school with, a lot of hours in their program. It's every program, every teaching. Some people would rather say, I want it short. We'd rather have a very good program. We are known for that. I think uh, when we work with Canam, this is one of the reasons is to work with a, a very solid school. 
um, and we've been there uh, representing that kind of quality and knowledge of the of the market in Montreal. So if I can have one more question, all done. Yeah, my question, I think you missed out on that. Give benefits of studying in Quebec and give us examples of successful alumni from La Salle. Okay, on successful alumni right now, I'm so sorry, I don't have the names with me, but we are having 5,000 students coming out uh, of La Salle, so we have, we have a lot of uh, uh, students. What we are uh, looking for is really how do we de uh, define the success is the, the rate of employment in Quebec, which is always under uh, capacity. So the demand for staff in many, many of our programs, and uh, that's where we're standing for now. And benefits of studying in Quebec? Benefits to study in Quebec is definitely multi-cultural, uh, uh, multi, uh, being bilingual, is uh, learning another language also. And the benefit of the lifestyle in Montreal, the capacity of living in the city at also a better price. It's a very affordable city and it's also uh, very uh, multicultural and um, activities and stuff like that. So living in Montreal is very nice. Okay, thank you so much. My next question goes to Saro. Saro, many international students during the pandemic got an opportunity to work full-time while studying, and they were, of course, thrilled. In your opinion, how should students find the right balance of work and study to be successful in their program and have enough experience in the job market to be better equipped for employment? Is 20 hours a week uh, of part-time work a good balance? Should they also choose programs with co-ops? And does it mean that programs without co-ops are not good enough? And another query often asked is that public colleges are setting up partnerships with private colleges in greater Toronto area so that students can qualify for postgraduate work permit. Now, is that a safe bet for students? I know I've asked you a lot of questions. but <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Thank you, Ganga. Thank you so much. It's great to be on this panel with uh, some old colleagues and some uh, current partners as well. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, such an important question, Ganga, that you asked me about uh, balance for students. Uh, I think international student well-being uh, success has been a big focus uh, over the last year for, for Canada. It's always been a focus, but it's been the, in the spotlight uh, because Canada is attracting uh, hundreds and thousands of students. They plan to attract millions of students over the next years. Uh, it's important to talk about balance. Um, when I talk to international students, I always tell them, focus on your end goal. Is your end goal starting in Canada for a year or two years, uh, moving back home? Is your end goal um, starting a business that June was referring to? Is your end goal working in industry? Uh, focus on your end goal. Uh, your end goal is not working 20 hours part-time. That is a good to have. Uh, that's important. That builds a lot of skills. That builds confidence that builds connections and you of course you earn uh, money uh, towards some of the living expenses but it's important to know that the program that you're doing the skills that you're learning in the program that is the number one reason that you've paid this money to be in Canada that is what will get you that future job that will what will make you a future Canadian if you want to be one so it's really important for students to prioritize um, and I've had hundreds of thousands of these conversations um, uh, over the last decade with students talking about prioritizing what is important to them. 20 hours per week is, is a good balance, I think. Uh, there has been talk in Canada um, about increasing that uh, to some extent. It has been increased as a part of a pilot for students who were already in Canada. Uh, um, so that has gone up. Uh, that's, that number has been, that limit of 20 hours has been taken away for some kinds of students. Um, but it's a pilot only till December 2023, and the college, uh, the, the, the country will reevaluate this. Uh, but 20 hours is a good balance because, as I said, it, it helps you build the skills, um, it helps you earn some money, but at the same time, you can focus on programs. The programs that students are choosing in Canada, in, in Canadian colleges and institutions, these are um, high demand programs. Um, uh, they're, they're in demand in the industry. But they're also demanding while you're studying these programs. 
uh, you, especially if you're at a graduate level program, if you are doing a graduate certificate, postgraduate, these programs have different names across Canada. Uh, the, I, I, these programs are sprints, I, I call them, not marathons. You don't have a lot of time. You're, you're doing it for one year and you're getting the skills uh, that you need in one year. There is a lot of demand uh, that your professors would have. At Fanshawe, we say, um, while you're in your program, uh, treat your professor like your boss. Um, always be professional, be on time, um, engage. And if you want to do things like that, prepare before your, uh, your, uh, your next lecture. But if you want to do things like that, that takes effort. That takes serious effort. And you, you need to focus on, on that kind of preparation if you really want to be successful in Canada. Um, Jeevan was also referring to earlier uh, networking. And I, I cannot stress enough, I think all the panelists would agree that uh, you have to network, you have to talk to people, get to know people. Uh, another example I give students is um, if you're, if you're in Canada, you're, uh, you're in India, you're studying, you probably know, count how many people you know, and you'll probably be able to count hundreds of people you know. And you're moving to a different country where if you have friends, you know 20 people. Right, like if you're really lucky, if you're family too, you know, 50 people maybe. But to actually be successful, you need to build your network to the level you had the network back at your home. And that means being involved in our community. Community involvement is so important in Canada. Being involved with your, uh, with your uh, professors, being involved in projects, uh, co-ops, internships, whatever, whatever form they might take is important as well. You asked about uh, co-op uh, and, and non-co-op programs. So co-op is such a neat uh, way for students to um, be involved in the industry while they're studying. But I will also say co-op is not the only way. Um, there, there are many, many things that happen in, in Canadian institutions uh, that are tremendous. Um, one example I give you specific to Fanshawe College is um, we committed, and this was pre-pandemic, we committed to building um, two signature learning experience, signature innovative learning experience as a part of every course, every subject that is offered at Fanshawe College. So Fanshawe underwent a redevelopment process for all its programs, all its courses, where we added two signature innovative learning experience. Learning experience could be a co-op. It could be a work integrated project. It could be, um, it could be a research project. It could be, it could take many forms, but every subject that you're not every program that you're doing at Fanshawe, every subject that you're doing as a part of the program, there are two signature learning, innovative learning experiences built into that program. That is ensuring you are in tune with what the industry wants today. And this is apart from the 66 plus uh, co-op programs that Fanshawe offers. But co-op or non-co-op, look at the industry, look at the content. Those are the kind of things that will tell you more about um, what kind of uh, work integrated learnings are built into the program. Uh, and the last part of your program uh, question was about uh, uh, public colleges and, and PPPs, uh, especially in the greater Toronto area. As Jim was saying, Fanshawe and ILAC uh, are partners. Um, I, th I think it's important to look at um, what uh, that PPP is. PPP overall, uh, are, uh, the PPP programs are overall absolutely a safe bet. They are authorized by the government. The programs go through the same approval process that any program at the uh, home campus might go through. <clears throat> Sorry. So the same ministry approvals, the same industry approvals that are needed for programs in, for example, in our case, London, Ontario campus would be the same that is required at Fanshawe Toronto at ILAC campus. Uh, so they're absolutely a safe bet. But uh, in our case, Fanshawe Toronto at ILAC is a partnership which is not one year old. ILAC has been a Fanshawe partner for last decade. So and ILAC is also an institution which has welcomed international students for the last 25 years uh, in Canada. So I think because of that, our partnership works really, really well. And in our partnership, uh, it's very unique because we are focusing on the areas that Jeevan was just talking about. He was talking about health uh, services, health, hospitality, human services. Those are the areas we're focusing on because we see a need for uh, and a skill gap and a, a labor market gap as well to fill that, especially in the greater Toronto area. So that's what uh, we are focusing on with Alec. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Saurabh. That was really uh, in detail. Uh, Yut, uh, the Goodman School of Business has been 
working closely with Canam for promoting their MBA and other master's programs for many years now. Now, an MBA is an expensive program the world over, yet it's a big draw with Indian students. Now, what kind of a student stands to gain most from an MBA in Canada? Now, do MBA accreditations help a student in any way because it is the accreditations which make the program expensive? So, do they help the student in any way? And do tell us more about your MBA ISP, the co-op and career outcomes of your students. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Gang. I appreciate the question. And I just want to say before I dive into my answer that anything that has been shared on the panel so far, I can absolutely um, agree with, particularly when it comes to the networking uh, and well as uh, taking the, you know, no matter what university or college you may choose to uh, go and study abroad, there are so many services that all of us are providing when it comes to co-op, career services, and so on. Uh, networking events. And it's really important that as a student, when you're abroad, that you are taking advantage of these opportunities that are offered by the institution that you are uh, attending. But really diving in, yeah, we've been working with Canon for a number of years. I think we're close to two decades now um, that the Goodman School of Business has been working with you guys. And we very much appreciate that the relationship that we have built over, over that time. But yeah, our MBA program, particularly our International Student Pathway program, is a program that we have designed with international students in mind to really make sure that we set them up for success while they're actually studying with us here at the Goodman School of Business, but also once they graduate. And how have we done that? There are a few different components that we are offering to students. One, of course, I think an MBA degree, and that is probably why so many students are interested in it, can be a door opener for many different industries and many different career paths. It's not very restricted to one specific niche industry. So it certainly is something, and, and I think that is something that has been stressed by the other panelists already, the degree sometimes is a necessity for you to get your foot into the door if you want to work for specific companies. So there's just a requirement that you would have hold an MBA degree to even get invited to an interview. So I think that is number one. But um, also that an MBA program can allow you to specialize, particularly if you maybe already know a specific area in, in a business field that you want to really get into uh, and specialize in. So here at the Goodman School of Business, we do offer uh, six different specializations. So we have accounting, finance, business analytics, which is a very big field, um, marketing, human research management, operations management, and finance. And again, it comes with, and that is something that Ganga mentioned as well, accreditation. So for instance, our accounting pathway really leads students, right, to be able to, uh, you know, go on and do their CPA Ontario qualification if you do want to become a licensed accountant here in Ontario. So it really kind of opens the door and gives you that pathway if that is something that you're looking at um, to kind of really get that best uh, way and, and your foot into the door again. The other thing, as I mentioned, um, we are offering a traditional MBA program as well, but the international student pathway really is designed to make sure that students have the extra support that they need. We are very aware that international students coming to Canada, it's a very different experience that you are having than domestic students joining a university in their home country. So we want to make sure that the services that you need to be academically successful are in place for you, as well as once you graduate. And the two big components that we offer here is what we've heard already from some of the other panelists, co-op. So we make sure that you, if you wish to participate in a co-op term, you have that opportunity to do so. Usually the co-op terms are four months and it's really an opportunity for you to start getting to know different industries here in Canada. And again, where it comes in, starting your network, building your network while you're here. Um, <clears throat> and what we've seen, excuse me, what we see in particular with our international students 
who are thinking that they would like to stay in Canada after uh, graduating from the program, we have seen that the co-op term can really be that stepping stone to actually secure a full-time employment after the completion of their program. And I just want to kind of name some of the example uh, employers that we are having here. So um, it's really a wide range of private and, and uh, um, public sector industries that we are having, uh, government um, ministries. So if you're thinking about we had we have uh, we have partnerships with the Ministry of Transportation, with the Ministry of Finance, um, we have seen and sent students to do their co-op at Coca-Cola, Bosch, John Deere, um, Siemens, uh, and, and many more uh, companies. Uh, so, and I think that's really a, a great way for international students, especially to gain extra work experience. And uh, usually these are paid uh, work experiences as well. I think that's an important part to consider. And also getting exposed to the North American business culture that can be very different from what you may have been uh, exposed to in your home country as well. So these things are important. The other component that we stress here um, at the Grumman School of Business is the component of experiential learning as part of your classroom experience. So what does that mean? That we actually give you the chance in the classroom to take your knowledge that you're gaining and really put it and use it on a real world example. So we've built a number of partnerships with our local businesses here in the Niagara region. They actually come in into the classroom. They will present students with a business problem that they are facing. And then our students are working on coming up with solutions and strategies that they are then pitching to these local companies. And it's just a very rewarding experience for our students because they can really see how can I use all that knowledge that I gained and, and how does it work when I want to apply it in, in the real world? But it's also, again, something where it's a networking opportunity for you. You're actually connecting with local businesses. So growing your network um, uh, as an opportunity, but also because you're acting as a real consultant, it's something you can put on your resume, on your LinkedIn profile, and so on. And then really the last one that I want to touch up on here as well is career services. And that has been mentioned by the other panelists uh, previously as well. Um, I think most of the university and colleges here in Canada offer a wide range of career services um, for students, whether that really is from very practical, you know, cover letter review. Um, how do I put my resume together? Uh, maybe preparation for an interview that you've been invited to, but also to um, sometimes very basic guidance. Let's say students don't quite know yet where they want to go with their degree. So then there can be counseling and really kind of mapping out that path. What industry are you interested in? And we heard, I think, one of the panelists used the word, what's the end goal? Where do you want to get to? Sometimes students know that, but they just quite don't know how to get there and what steps are kind of needing to be taken along the way. So, um, so all of these services are available to students. And I just want to stress the important thing for students really is to, it's great. As I said, most of the institutions in Canada are offering a lot of services, but as a student, you need to be proactive. If you're coming to Canada, you're paying that tuition fee, you're paying for these career services, you're paying that you are going and speaking those to those professionals that are on campus that are there for you to really come and seek their guidance. They're wanting to help you, but it's really up to the individual students to take advantage of all these right range of services that universities do provide uh, to students. Okay, thanks so much, Jude. That was really in detail. Uh, my next question is to Tatiana. Tatiana, Global University Systems owns a large number of successful educational institutions across Canada and in other countries. Now, the aim has been to develop and get approved new programs aimed at future employability during the post-graduation work permit period and beyond. Now, how do your group of colleges ensure that their programs are relevant to the industry? What processes do you adopt to assist international students towards industry placements during and after their study? 
Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, Ganga, thank you very much for the question and for the warm welcome at the beginning. Uh, first of all, I would like to say um, to our dear students that uh, definitely a huge well done on joining the session and i totally agree with uh, ute who mentioned um, in her speech that it is extremely important for you to be proactive if you want to succeed with your future goals so um and I believe that joining these kind of uh, sessions, uh, you are doing a big good step uh, towards your dreams. Um, and yeah, Ganga, just getting back to your question. So how do we ensure that our courses are industry relevant? Well, um, our schools maintain close relationships with hundreds of industry leading companies across Canada. For example, our CCTB courses in Vancouver are aligned to the BCPNP standard, ensuring the courses are developing industry ready graduates to enter the Canadian workforce. Um, all of our schools take a consultative approach by including our industry partners in program development. And uh, also, we work closely with the Canadian governmental guidelines to ensure we are building programs that address the job and skills gap in the country, which the government is, re is relying on international students to help with. Um, and um, definitely all our Canadian institutions prioritize work study capabilities, uh, meaning um, studies always get an opportunity to engage in practical learning in um, a real Canadian workforce environment. Um, Schools like UCW, so University of Canada West, um, even invest in equipping students with access to real business tools so they can use the platforms and systems they'll be expected to be competent with by the time they enter the workforce. Um, also, uh, talking about processes for placement before and after study, um, it's important to say that all our schools ensure that students uh, receive opportunities to work during and after their studies. Our award-winning co-op programs at schools like TSOM and CCTB ensure students complete a placement at a company relevant to this industry of study um, as a mandatory part of their course. Practical learning is essential and it's why we prioritize it in our classes. Um, students are counseled all along the way by our outstanding career services teams um, who look to please students and um, to place students and graduates alike with roles in companies that align with their interests and skills. Uh, we are also always hosting events like talks or career fairs where students and graduates meet one to one with our industry partners and other companies seeking the skills of international students to create a diverse and global workforce. So, uh, dear students, just imagine when you come to Canada uh, to study there, to live there, to uh, develop your career there, uh, just imagine that while you're studying, you also have uh, fantastic opportunities to develop your personal branding uh, by attending career development workshops, by uh, learning how to create CV and cover letters, uh, how to uh, create your LinkedIn uh, profiles, um, in participate in mock interviews. Also, um, this is incredible when the university supports you in the way like organizing networking development um, activities like, like uh, networking events, guest speakers, career fairs, where definitely you guys need to be proactive. So you don't just uh, go there and uh, look at people, but you do uh, try to build a network for your future career. Uh, same like here, um, please, if you have any questions, do use this opportunity and and use the um, uh, live chat box to ask these questions and we're here to help you. That's it from me. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tatiana. Yeah, that was great. So um, my next question is actually, uh, I've derived it from what you was talking about. And uh, I know this is also a question by many, most of the students before I move to the audience questions. I'm throwing this question open to Hazel, sort of, uh, uh, Jeevan, uh, let's see what you have to say about this. Uh, 
uh, you talked about certification of the MBA program. So like uh, we also are aware that colleges have many of their skill uh, certification programs certified by industry um, in, in different fields. So would you like to talk about that as well? So the students are again are, are able to understand what is the industry certification about and why is it necessary when it comes to employability? Sure, Ganga, I'll, I'll take it, uh, start off with it. Uh, absolutely right. I mean, students, when they are exploring and when they are uh, choosing their programs, they should dig deeper and find out what kind of credentials, what, kind, what more are they getting out of that program? For example, pharmacy technician, you know, you are able to work in that related field but what kind of credential, where all can you work? And at MITT, we really like to share that information because the student would be able to work in different related fields in spe highly specialized for which you need to have that credential. You cannot otherwise get a job in that area. And the academic program builds towards that. So yes, in terms of co-op and practicum, but also to look at what more can you get? And these are those credentials licenses which are very linked uh, with their field and many of the areas require that global supply chain management for example you you get several credentials towards it at MITT the program that you do similarly many of our institutions uh, do offer that so yes Ganga students should look at that because that's a huge opportunity our institutions are offering to our students uh, which enhances their job prospects which gets them oh, a foot in the door for sure through their practicum and through their co-op options built in the program. But also these credentials make it a very facilitative pro uh, process to get into it. Can I request Saurabh and Jeevan also to give us more insights on certifications, maybe some more examples as well? Um, yes. Uh, so I'll give an example. Through our Georgian programs, um, we have project management um, program, which is eligible to, for students to then apply for their PMP certification. Our human resources management program is then also eligible for students to then go and apply to join and get a certification under CHRP. Now, these certificates are very, very good because as more and more professionals are in colleges and universities, trying to find a certificate can also be an additional way you're enhancing your profile and your competitiveness when you're a job seeker. You're also then hoping that if you've got this professional qualification and certification, it can also lead to you going into more senior roles. So let's say if you want to go into, if you start up in a coordinator position and your goal is I want to go into management or I want to be a director, sometimes the difference can be having that industry relevant certification. It also helps you with when it comes to potential salaries. We're working to make money as well to support ourselves. So if you have that additional certification, it can help you then potentially ask for the higher range in a salary as well. I would also mention that um, in our programs, so for example, at Fantra at Toronto, we also um, encourage students to look at gaining micro-credentials. So let's say, for example, if you're in the hospitality sector, you might want to be looking at what's called a smart serve, which allows you to serve alcohol. Um, you might want to be looking at food handlers or your first aid. So even whilst you're studying or whilst you're looking at jobs after graduation, there are still smaller certificates as well that enhance your profile. Um, I spoke to a hotel manager about two, three weeks ago, and he told me he had 400 applications for a position. And one thing he looks for is who's got their smart serve, who's got their food handlers, um, who's got their customer service certificates as well. Um, so as well as the large certificates, we always try and encourage students do everything you can and get smaller certificates as well so that you can be a competitive candidate. And I'll hand it over to Sarab if he has anything. Uh, absolutely. I'll just add examples because I think Hazel and Nipun have explained why the certifications are really important. Uh, they're just like an industry standard and you're 
telling the employer, you meet that industry standard or exceeded. Uh, IT is another big area where there are tons of certifications. Um, uh, CCNA, CCNP are credentials recognized across the world. CISSP is a more specialized in uh, security uh, professional uh, kind of program. Um, it, accounting and finance is, is a huge area where there are certifications as well. Now, um, the one thing that you should be aware of, if you have certifications from back home, uh, some of those credentials are valid in Canada. Not all, but some of those credentials in terms of certifications are valid, especially in the IT industry, for example. Uh, those credentials are absolutely valid uh, in, in Canada, in, in even in the finance industry. There are certifications which are valid in Canada. You'd need to do uh, certain uh, components of that certification again. For example, taxation would be very different in Canada as compared to uh, India. So uh, th there are a tremendous number of certifications in marketing as well. It, I think in India, sometimes we think certifications are only for some specialized programs and technology or uh, IT or uh, finance programs, but there are certifications everywhere. Even in a general business management program, there'll be uh, a chartered management uh, association with there can be a certification. Uh, marketing, there are certifications. HR certification, I think, uh, CHIRP certification, one of the most reputed certifications in Ontario uh, in HR. And so there are certifications almost in every kind of program that students are, are looking at entering into. Thank you. Thank you, Saurabh. Thank you all. Uh, Yut, would you like to say something or should I move on to the next question? I think we can probably move on to the next question. I would just alliterate that Yes, absolutely. When you're looking at a program, uh, do, may, do have a look at what accreditation the program has uh, and what pathway, you know, that opens up once you have that as well. So I think uh, all of the uh, uh, all of the um, item points that were just shared by the panels, I think, are really good, good tips for students to be aware and look out for. Okay. All right. So uh, the next question, this question from the audience. Uh, what is the work opportunity for postgrads in mechanical streams in Canada? And will recession predicted for the coming years affect work opportunities? I, I can start if, if that's okay. Um, so mechanical engineering is, is tremendous, tremendous career. We've attracted students in our college for over a decade in programs like this. Um, so technology uh, is, is is really good. So you're talking about recession right now, but I think uh, especially in the manufacturing industry, uh, the, the developed world saw a recession a decade, two decades ago, where a lot of the lower end manufacturing moved out of Canada, moved out of US already. So it's not happening right now. It happened 20 years ago. However, what the, a country like Canada focused on, uh, what a province like Ontario focused on is advanced manufacturing, more detailed, more uh, high-end manufacturing. And that's something Ontario, especially Ontario, is doing really, really well in. So there is a move away from automotive, regular automotive uh, industry right now. Huge focus right now in Ontario on electric vehicle manufacturing. So it's the same, uh, same, same industry, but it's being dealt with in a in a with a new kind of energy, focus on the environment, focus on where the demand is right now, uh, as well. So uh, me mechanical manufacturing, uh, there there are multiple applications to it. When you talk about mechanical, even in aviation, uh, composites, materials, uh, even in automotive, there is tremendous applications from a program like this. And if you look at um, our um, uh, surveys, our Statistics Canada surveys, uh, especially focused on Ontario because that is the data I look at. Uh, mechanical engineering is one of the uh, five top areas of employment in Ontario uh, for the next eight years. So the, the, the future looks really good for mechanical manufacturing industry as well. Tatiana, would you like to add something about the recession and how it affects, I mean, is it going to be affecting any future work opportunities? Uh, actually, uh, actually, you know, I, I would like to give um, a little bit different advice to, to our students because I see um, it's, it's great when uh, they, when you the students ask uh, uh, questions about particular program, particular area. But um, what I would like to share with you now is a very useful tip for you guys um, because, you know, while you are 
getting ready to enter university abroad, you, you know, your thoughts, your priorities uh, on programs may change. Um, but I believe that uh, what you definitely need to do before choosing the area of studies and uh, looking into your career opportunities in the future, um, please do some homework yourself on um, using these tips. So um, do the labor market analysis um, in the countries that you would like to study. So um, I will share with you a few websites in the chat after my speech uh, that will help you to navigate in the Canadian uh, labor market um, uh, offers. Um, and um, you, you uh, by analyzing the uh, labor market in the country, you will be able to select the most demandable areas um, also, for example, you are dreaming to work in a particular company, you know, a huge uh, brand, you know, um, known worldwide, uh, which uh, is based in Canada, the headquarters, let's say, and you know about that. And um, what I would recommend you to do uh, is to analyze the LinkedIn profiles of these companies, uh, of their employees' background, uh, their degrees, career development. So, for example, you take um, an employee profile of this company on LinkedIn and just look how uh, their career was developing, what uh, kind of education these uh, people had, um, how long did it take them to move from one position to another within the company. So uh, this is a great tip, I think, and this is what you should do, what you should start doing even before entering the country. Uh, so you need to remember that the job search is your responsibility, first of all, and this is your full time job from the moment you decide to go to study abroad until the, uh, you actually get the job. So start looking for opportunities from the first day of your um, studies, but not even studies, but from the first day you uh, decide to move abroad, study abroad and um, develop your career abroad. Yeah, that's it. I will share the, a few websites in the chat so you can. Um, uh, so uh, do your own analysis and research as well. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, my next question is from the audience to look. Um, what are DEC programs and uh, can students complete the DEC programs in English or is it necessary to do it in French? Hi again. Uh, yes, we can finish all the DEC in English, no problem. <clears throat> And all AACs are definitely available in English. We can, when you are accepted for immigration in Canada, in a school in Quebec, you'll be able to study an English program. You can definitely uh, finalize that program. The opportunities are there, the needs are there. Uh, I think it's important to know, all, you, she is right. Um, it's important to know your market and your labor uh to analyze your labor force of what you want to study to make sure that you're going into the right path and from there uh we have uh, we have a, a lot of aces that can be uh followed up most of them are in english many were prepared two years ago for india um with the indian team to make sure that those programs were uh particularly um aligned for the uh, PGWP and etc. So yes. Okay. Uh, here's another question from the audience. Uh, please tell me. Okay, I think the 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 student is a doctorate uh, program holder. Maybe has a PhD, and uh, she wants to know what are the career opportunities or how can we upgrade our skills if you already have a PhD uh, PhD uh, degree. So would like any of you like to answer this? I don't mind addressing that, Ganga. Um, PhD, I mean, it's a very academic program uh, that you have completed. Uh, how do you enhance yourself? So a lot of our courses or programs are very industry-based, which is more application-based, more hands-on. So there, it doesn't mean that learning can stop. Learning is a lifelong journey. So I would recommend, uh, for example, at MITT, we offer a program called Applied Leadership. It is really for people of uh, caliber who've had either years of experience and are looking at enhancing themselves 
coming with a lot of base knowledge, experience, both academic as well as professional. So look at for a program that would give you that dimension that would enhance your entire CV, which actually makes it more, uh, uh, you know, in terms of job readiness, applying knowledge. So there is a whole academic piece of it, but also in terms of being able to apply knowledge. At the end of the day, it depends on your goal. Where, uh, how have you, you know, carved out for yourself? How do you see yourself in the next few years? Thank you. Um, I wouldn't mind just adding uh, one little note for anybody that might be already holding a PhD because uh, it can be quite tricky because I think you're at a stage where you might be thinking, well, I don't really want to necessarily also go back uh, to university. Um, it really depends, uh, as we just heard, on your career goal. But um, one thing that might be important and that is probably different depending in different countries there are lots of universities here in Canada offering also wonderful postdoc opportunities um, for international students. Sometimes it's a little bit harder to be aware of them and find them uh, because they're actually advertised within the university career sites that you may not be thinking of. Um, so if you kind of think about maybe not switching over to uh, you know, a, a job in that matter, but would like to uh, continue on your professional career in the in academia, um, then certainly do pick out a few universities that offer the field that you have done your PhD in and just really browse their uh, their career pages and see if they are offering any postdoc opportunities. Um, and that might be something, uh, a good way to, to uh, kind of Go, go that pathway as well, go into that area. Saru, would you like to add something? Um, I would just say like, uh, PhD, we have a lot of students who come with PhDs and uh, my panelists, I think already spoke about some of the opportunities for them. But if you're looking for um, upgrading your skills and getting into the industry, there, there are a lot of programs available at the post-grad level. Uh, which can help upgrade your skills um, in the industry that you want to be. So Hazel spoke about the leadership program that they offer. Uh, at, at grad cert level, there are other programs as well. Uh, so, and PhD students can really look at where do they want to be in, in Canada and take those programs. So program could be, could be really anything which is relevant to their background, but also helps them get to where uh, they want to be. And um, some of the programs which... PhD students uh, find uh, interesting at in college levels are programs like research and evaluation uh, because they already have a research uh, bed of mind. Uh, these are programs which are specific to industry though. So every program we offer are specific to specific industries. Uh, we have another program called regulatory affairs, so, uh, but that's specific to pharma pharmaceutical industries. Um, so, so there are programs like there, but Again, you have to do your research and see where you want to be based on the skills you already have and look at a relevant program that can help you get there. Absolutely. So true. I mean, the PhD could be in any field. So if the PhD, let's say, is in logistics and supply chain or something, you know, or, or something related to that, and they, they want to get a certification or the industry certification uh, over the academic knowledge that they have. So that's uh, that's another thing that they can look at. So yeah, I think uh, so. PA, people with PhD should not think that there are no skills that they can upgrade to. There are a lot of options and it just depends upon which field you're specialized in and what do you really want to apply and, and, and uh, upskill yourself on. Okay, I think Tatiana, there is a message for you. Can you please share the links that you were talking about? Uh, and uh, probably uh, if you if you send it to the chat admin and she will forward it to everyone. Exactly. Yeah, I was trying to send it to the uh, chat, but uh, it would allow me to send it only to the admin, uh, to the admin um, um, manager. So yeah, please, if could, uh, if admin could share it. Yeah, she'll do that. She, uh, Sharon, uh, chat admin. She will. She will just forward it to everyone. Thank you. Okay, the next question. Uh, I think the PPP has tickled people's minds. So. <laughs> The question is, what is this private-public partnership model in Canadian education? Why did this become popular among Indian students, as you spoke about? Uh, how are regulations put in place by the Canadian government to ensure that this is a successful uh, procedure? 
and one that will feed the labor market, which in turn will should be a wise investment for the student. Um, so I can uh, start by just kind of talking about why PVPs actually came uh, under being. So uh, honestly, the, the reason why PVPs were approved by the ministry uh, in Ontario specifically was uh, the capacity that uh, public institutions have at our home campuses. Uh, we, we, Fanshaw, at Fanshaw, we have 10,000 international students. However, the demand is, is more than that. And not just demand from the students, the demand from the industry as well. Uh, because international students are a key part of any company's um, recruitment strategy right now. Um, so that was in part the reason why it, uh, this was approved. But the regulations in, put in place, as I mentioned earlier, now private cultures have their own very specific, uh, and I, I think probably Jeevan can talk a little more about that. Uh, they have their own specific regulations, which are very uh, detailed. But public colleges... Um, when you do a private-public partnership, um, the credential you get is a public college credential. So, the, For example, if you're doing the same program in Fanshawe's London campus or Woodstock campus or Toronto campus, the credential you get is the same credential. There is absolutely no difference between the credential. So the public partner is responsible for program uh, accreditation, which goes through the same thorough program accreditation process that any of our 220 other programs go through. So that's something which is really important. And also uh, in, in Toronto, um, that's why when I was saying Fanshawe Toronto at ILAC focuses on health, human services, hospitality, we believe there is a lot of business IT programs, great programs happening already. We wanted to focus in our partnership on the health, hospitality, human services, where there is a lot of specific demand from the industry. And through the pandemic, that is where the service industry and the health, uh, hospital, uh, human services industry that is where a lot of the challenges were faced and we wanted our partnership to be a solution to that challenge uh, for students and for employers as well and then i'll jump in so um i work for i like higher education and one of our pub um, public partners is financial college so how we operate is financial college have an incredible reputation and at ILAC, as part of Fanshawe Toronto at ILAC, we have to meet that same standard. So if you are studying in London or you're studying at the Toronto campus, you get the same level of support. So that means you get industry experts as your faculty members. You get the same opportunities for placement, co-op and internships. But career support and student support, it's the same. Fanshawe College, for example, has the leading career services department in colleges. So we have to make sure we are matching that. So if you are a Toronto student or London student, you are getting that same support. And even for everybody at ILAC, our goal is to always make sure we are at the same level as our um, public partner. Um, and as I mentioned, one of the things that ILAC have a history of is 25 years. ILAC has been a globally recognized language school. So even to arrange this partnership, there had to be a lot of scrutiny. So when Fanshawe um, were raising the possibility, they had to select a partner that aligned with them. And then whenever the public institution is submitting the proposal, they have to make sure it gets submitted to the ministry for approval. Um, so it's a very, very thorough process. And how it gets judged is there are going to be um, ministry audits Whenever the public institution has to report finances, it has to include the private public partnership numbers. Um, and anytime there's a contract agreement or a renewal, it's analyzed very deeply. So whether you are at the main campus in London, for example, or at the campus in Toronto, you do get the same support. And Sarab and I have had multiple calls um, over the last month um, to make sure that yes, we are always on the same page and every department is the same as well. So um, you still get the same level of support. Yeah, I would also like to add that um, among uh, DAS universities in Canada, we also have lots of PPT, PPP um, options. And um, uh, I would just like to add to my co-panelists that already told you a lot about this uh, um, option and opportunities that it offers, that um, Another very um, attractive, attractive thing um, is that when 
a private um, college uh, jo uh, joins the a public a public big public um, university for example um, in our group of uh, gas institutions in Canada we have um, uh, Niagara College Toronto so when uh, Niagara College Canada um, a big prestigious university um, with uh, over 11,000 students uh, uh, joining annually um, from all, over 100 countries, right? When they joined their forces, the students get an opportunity to uh, get the same quality of Niagara College Canada in Toronto. So in um, a very nice uh, progressive city, uh, probably if if you are as a student, if you as a student uh, dream to uh, live in a particular uh, town in Canada, um, so this kind of PPP um, study option can be a great choice because if the main uh, university that you're looking at are, is, is based somewhere, somewhere else, but your PPP a college is in the town of your dream. So this is another reason to choose this. Also, again, um, using the example of uh, Niagara College Toronto, uh, in Toronto, uh, our students uh, get um, uh, they, they, they get the uh, career opportunities offered by uh, NCC um, and plus the Toronto School of Management because both institutions um, separately have their database of uh, partners, uh, career partners, uh, and um, NCT students get offers from all this database of over 300 partners um, and these offers are usually sent by email or you know shared on the um, in the um, student chat so another reason because you have um, uh, more resources coming from both institutions the government one and the private one thank you thank you tatiana okay uh, this is a great question the talent strategy of canadian education cannot just be limited to expanding learning in the skilled trades how can academics and employability go hand in hand? Uh, I think uh, they're quite intertwined, actually. Academic and uh, employability or, you know, in terms of the whole approach. I mean, the idea, of course, uh, I'm going to back it up a little bit. Every student, when you're desiring of your journey, academic journey, professional journey. Uh, I think one of our panelists, uh, I think sort of talked about the end goal. It's very important to kind of have some framework, some understanding of where am I planning to go? Because based on that, you can then decide where am I, how do I fit in? So am I really an academic research oriented person? So Pursuing a course or a program is very, very important for that. I'm a researcher. But if I'm somebody who wants to be equipped with a skill, which is hands-on, job-ready, I want to get into the industry, apply it, come back, upskill myself. And that's one of the things uh, which many of our institutions constantly endeavor to do is to make our courses and academic learning very relevant to the career uh, you know, the career opportunities, but to the industry, because that keeps on being dynamic. That is a very, and so our courses are very responsive to that. So it is very closely linked. Um, I think I would like to jump in and just uh, touch up on something that I mentioned early on is experiential learning, which I kind of comes uh, and you can probably find in more and more universities now in different programs that universities are offering across campus. And I think that's their meant to really combine those two things where you are attending your course, you are, uh, you know, kind of studying the theoretical part um, of, uh, of the content of whatever you're focusing on. But then with this experiential learning component, what universities are trying to do is really to have companies, partners, businesses coming into the classroom and presenting their students with a, you know, business problem or, you know, whatever sector they're coming from um, that is related to that 
course that they are taking, where students have the opportunity to really take that knowledge that they gain from their classroom and put it into practice and see how does it actually work? Because yes, there's certainly a component of, um, I sometimes say, you can be a wonderful grade A student, but if you never had the opportunity to actually put into practice what you learned, it will be very hard to make that transition into the job market sometimes. You can be a wonderful student, but it, there's just more to it, uh, you know, kind of more soft skills that are important than just having the knowledge uh, behind you. And I think experiential learning, if that is something that might come across when you're looking into uh, different programs and how their courses and classes are structured, that could be something that is then certainly of interest to you because you're kind of getting that component, getting that, you know, the academic side of things, getting the theoretical knowledge, but having the opportunity to put it into practice right in the class, right in the classroom. If I can jump in one little minute or two, uh, I think this is a great subject uh, when it comes to LaSalle College with the AECs. Um, we have many, many students that arrive already with a degree from India that are coming for a two-year program that is strictly technical and that we don't have to have the, the English classes and the academic classes and stuff like that. And they develop a skills where we find them. Uh, and I'll be, uh, I'll be frank on this. I already, I have a, a close attention to the Indian students on my, on my uh, since the India office reports directly to me and we get to know them more and more. And one, one good thing is we have, advanced student, students arriving for technical and learning something so specific. So what does it do? It brings the level and the ranking of the grades in the class much higher because they're already smart and good. So they're already educated and that makes, uh, makes them coming out of La Salle very qualified. And I think this is a, definitely an avenue where when you want to immigrate to Montreal or to Quebec uh, province, and you have something to, to that you, we have so many AECs, I think people can study in a specific field as a degree and then move into a technical and say, this is where I'm gonna go. Compared to a 19 year old that wants to uh, move into a program, then maybe you should be a little bit older and take a, a three-year program to dive into Canadian uh, lifestyle and everything. So I wanted to add this something. Thank you. And I think very related to this is the next question. It says, um, public colleges in Canada offer some of the most highly specialized programs in healthcare, artificial intelligence, digital marketing, and so on. But many students and parents still prefer traditional degree programs in computer science, commerce, etc. So as a parent, it's very confusing to help a student or a child decide where to go and what program to choose. So what's your comment on that? I can go first if people don't mind. Uh, we know that we have a new uh, cybersecurity minister and ministry. In, uh, so this is definitely to convince 600,000 jobs will be created in the next three years in cybersecurity and AI. Uh, I think this is a huge, huge amount that people need to, to understand. And I think it's probably our job to explain that and promote that more to the parents and students. But yes, it's a good point. And I think knowing that uh, the, 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 we are expanding programs on this on an exponential uh, rate because of this demand and the movement of the country into cybersecurity and all the, 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 the affiliates. Thanks. Can I like just add? Sorry, go ahead, Tatiana. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, for the parents, for the students, uh, in general, for people who want to learn uh, something, uh, and it's like uh, this is this decision would be like life changing for them and their their um, kids. Uh, you know, I would definitely recommend first of all to go to the specialist. Uh, 
uh, who know about this um, area that you are you know trying to <laughs> do research on uh, and for example, this is, you know, you're participating in this series of um, webinars with uh, Canom Education, and um, you can see how um, great the uh, Canom's connection with the uh, um, Canadian institutions. You see all these faces, uh, you know, from the industry. So this is the answer, I believe, the main answer to your question, because if you don't know what to choose, go to the professional who knows and who has all the connection uh, connections in the, um, in the country uh, within these um, educational options, and they would recommend you the best uh, according to your um, child's needs, your uh, family needs. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. That's a, that's a great point, Tatiana. Uh, I will just, I'll take a different spin to this question as well, uh, because a lot of uh, students I meet say this is a new program. So is this a good program to choose? Because the program which has been there for 10 years, everyone knows about it. I always tell uh, uh, students that uh, the, the institutions go through a very rigorous new program approval process. Institutions are really acting uh, are responding to the labor market demand from the industry. So if a program is new, that means the labor market demand that the, that the institution has looked at is, is current. Uh, as a Canadian public, uh, as an Ontario public college, we have to submit those numbers to the ministry. We have to have a panel of uh, industry professionals actually say that our program is a good fit for their employment needs. Uh, we have to get all that accreditation before our program gets approved. So if a program is new, uh, look at the employment rate, the labor market data, uh, the employment demand, uh, but that don't assume that a program is new and that means a, that's that's a risky move or should not be looked at. New programs are many times uh, the most relevant uh, programs to look at in terms of the labor market demand. And I, I, I think with that, we are moving to the end of the session today. Um, so in conclusion, after hearing all the panelists, um, I think Canada's total job vacancies are around 8,71,300 across Canada between September and October 2022, according to Statistics Canada. And Canada's economy certainly continued to recover after easing of public health restrictions, which is what happened uh, and most around the world. The record high level of job vacancies hit 1 million plus in June 2022, which is due to growth in overall employment and falling unemployment. Now, the healthcare and social assistance industry continued to see Canada's highest number of job, vac job vacancies for any single sector in October 2022, like most of the panelists have spoken about. Accommodation and food services, tra retail trade, manufacturing, professional, scientific, and technical services are all sectors with large, large vacancies, even now. Now, as international students, if you can plan your program of study related to specific skill development, you can write your success story in Canada. As you've heard all the panelists speak, they do a lot. The colleges support international students in a very, very big way as far as their career options are concerned, as the employability is concerned, as far as their industry partnerships are concerned, all of that helps you to get there. So a big round of applause for all our panelists today for bringing out all these key points about the job market related to study programs. And I can see a lot of grateful thank you messages in the chat box. And talking about the chat box, I can see a lot of uh, personal, particular um, you know, uh, profile related questions. And like I promised, if you have put in your WhatsApp number and the city that you're from, we will also get a CANAM counselor, Tatiana suggested, a specialist counselor who will connect with you in the next two days and give you answers to your specific questions. So meanwhile, of course, thank you for all the other general questions and all the amazing questions that you guys posted from the audience. Our next session today uh, is uh, on from 5.30 to 7 p.m. Indian Standard Time. It's also a much sought after topic and you will meet RCICs that are regulated Canadian immigration consultants from various provinces to understand the different permanent residency pathways across Canada for international students after study. Do register on www.canamgroup.com in case you haven't already done so to receive the Zoom link for that session. We also have the entire schedule 
uh, on the website. So you will also get to know all the other programs. Some of you have also asked me about the other programs and uh, what are the other topics. So thank you all and have a great day. Thanks, Thanks a lot, so everyone. Thanks for having us. Thank you, everyone. Best Thank of you. luck to everybody. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.